Welcome back to Addiction Counseling Techniques, and I'd like to just apologize at the jump here. My aim was to make this one shorter, to give you a little break halfway through, and there's just so much to cover here, and I'm really passionate about this topic, so I think it might end up being on the longer side, and I just want to make sure that I am going to make it up to you next week. It's going to be shorter, but today we're going to be discussing the topic of ambivalence. Ambivalence is often a time of confusion and frustration for individuals in a recovery process. This is the idea of wanting to change and potentially not knowing how to change. This is the crossroads or the intersection that can be very informative to a treatment process and lend to effective treatment outcomes when managed well throughout the counseling process. So what is ambivalence? It's simply the state of having mixed feelings or contradictory feelings about something. It's a difficult feeling and something that we've all experienced when we feel torn between two choices. I'm hungry. Do I want to eat a nice, salty, fatty Wendy's cheeseburger, or should I eat that sad salad in my fridge that I've been neglecting for days? I'm ambivalent. Either option seems fine. There's pros and cons to each. What do I choose? Something like a decisional balance here might help me choose, but it also might not quite yet if both options seem as equally good or as equally bad. Ambivalence is just a step on the way to change. Another way to think about ambivalence is that it indicates progress from a pre-contemplation to contemplation stage. What's tough about being in the state of ambivalence is that a person moves closer to one choice, then the other choice can begin to seem a little bit more appealing. A similar phenomenon can happen if the counselor expresses interest in one argument for or against change. When this happens, the client will most likely respond with the counter argument. Again, this is the push-pull of being torn between two choices. And this is why when exploring ambivalence and change, counselor neutrality is incredibly important. The counselor favoring one side will push the client to defend the other side of change. So if you told me, well, Jen, you didn't eat any vegetables today yet, and you did say you wanted to watch your weight, and you wanted to save some money, so maybe a salad would be in your best interest, I might come back and say, yeah, but at Wendy's, I can also get a Frosty, and right now they have pumpkin Frosties, and oh, I bet those fries are really fresh and hot and salty right now. Do you see my predicament? So ambivalence is not resistance. Many therapists view ambivalence as resistance and a challenge to the overall therapeutic process. We must be careful not to confuse ambivalence as a sign of manipulation, deceit, or resistance. In the therapeutic process, we must look at this from a different trauma-informed, strength-based lens and recognize that there are components to the ambivalence that we need to address in the treatment process. Ambivalence can be expressed at any stage of change. However, I do believe it's more prominent in the pre-contemplation and contemplation stages of change. This is where most of the value and goal exploration starts to come into play. This is also a time of questioning, who am I? What do I want? What do I want to be? How do I want to get there? Ambivalence and secondary gain. It's unknown to the client. It's not manipulative. So what does this mean? What's secondary gain? My favorite example of secondary gains are, think about when you were a kiddo or if you have kiddos of your own. Maybe one day you woke up with a bellyache from eating too much Wendy's and asked to stay home from school. And that bellyache was real and painful and you certainly didn't belong in school. But think about what else was rewarding you to stay home or ask to stay home. You get to sleep in, you got breakfast in bed, maybe lunch if you could hold it down. Mom might have said some sweet words to you. Maybe you got to watch cartoons or a movie, sleep all day. You know, other than the belly egg, that seems like a nice little vacation from school. So all of that is secondary gains. Now, if you did not have a belly ache and asked to stay home anyway so that you could watch SpongeBob and eat soup, that would be manipulative. Not saying you ever did this. I definitely did. So now think about our clients and ambivalence and secondary gains from being ambivalent. If I'm your client and I'm ambivalent, My secondary gain is that I don't have to make my own choices. Someone else, you, will decide and tell me what to do. The problem here is now I have no control over my own life and I've learned not to trust myself. And if I don't trust myself, then how could I possibly make any decision at all? And this can be very cyclical. So at times you might see ambivalence create a secondary gain for people that might be subconscious. They might not recognize the depth of that. Help them to explore the benefits of staying ambivalent. We must look for the inferences and look for what's not being said to explore potential secondary gain when we see ambivalence presence.
and maintaining the status quo. Intrinsic, intrinsic to a client's experience of ambivalence is the desire to maintain the status quo. Although I want to make change, there's a lot of work in making change. And sometimes there's that sense of comfort in keeping things status quo and not stepping out in blind faith and having to explore the unknown. There's a lot of fear and anxiety that's provoked in those scenarios. And consider that all change is loss, all of it. And maybe I have some complicated grief in my past and I don't really cope well with loss. So changing anything becomes too overwhelming. So to counter the status quo argument, people tend to think it's more comfortable just to stay where I am, but it's truly not. There's this great quote out there that you might bump into. Change happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. So how do we engage in motivational interviewing skills and techniques to help elicit change? Many therapists misinterpret ambivalent behavior as resistance and label the client as oppositional or resistant and believe that the ambivalence must be overpowered. If you catch yourself thinking, why won't they just do what's best for them? Why won't they just do what I tell them to do? Or I love this one. If you would have listened to me, you wouldn't be in this predicament right now. This is all counter transference. Check yourself, check your goals versus the client goals, seek consultation, seek supervision around this. It's time to look in the mirror as a counselor. It might not be the client. It might be the idea that the counselor is moving along with their own agenda and not the client's agenda and misinterpreting language and creating a rupture to the therapeutic alliance. The client might be less likely to open up in session, misbehave or act out in groups or show or their show rate is drastically decreasing and they're starting to withdraw from treatment process overall. So here's a discussion prompt. As an addiction counselor, how will you guard against misinterpreting ambivalence? Manifestations of ambivalence. So when we look at the emotional state of ambivalence, the client's expression of emotions can frequently reveal ambivalence. This is the concept of being congruent or incongruent. Are we putting on the mask? Are we showing just the tip of the iceberg? What's going on underneath? If I'm in tears telling you everything's okay, we must be checking in about the expression of emotions and bringing to light the inconsistencies and incongruence, life present circumstances that must be addressed. Below in the module, I'll link a really great poem that can be a powerful read in a group or an individual setting. It's called The Masks We Wear. Don't be fooled by the face I wear, for I wear a thousand masks and none of them are me. Anyway, check it out, but be careful. It can bring a grown man to tears. Ambivalence sometimes happens when a client is bumping up against conflicting core values. I value my family, but I also value my freedom and my family telling me what to do all the time isn't making me feel very free. Emotions such as anger, resentment, frustration are aroused because the client appraises the situation to be threatening to their beliefs. Individuals who are experiencing ambivalence are tapping into emotions that may be very uncomfortable for them. These might be the same emotions that cause them to pick up mood-altering chemicals, the same emotions that they choose to avoid for a long period of time. So now we're asking them not to and only deal with them, but we're asking them to cope in a positive and effective way. This, of course, is going to arouse some anxiety-provoking emotions. This is going to create some potential behavior changes, if not addressed and combated in a way that's effective to help the individual align their values and goals. Ambivalence might have some behavioral manifestations as well and might feel like a game of tug of war with the client. This push and pull, and you're seeing it come out in not only in emotions, but in the ways that people are behaving. And that's your feedback. But then when you give your feedback, they don't want the feedback <laughs> that you provided. And you know, this constant back and forth, back and forth, and nobody's feeling as though they're doing anything productive. If you reflect back on the earlier modules, when we were talking about congruence and value exploration, helping people to see that they have the answers within that they have skills, assets, and abilities, the symptoms that develop become the expression of the fact that the person is squeezed between the poles of ambivalence. What someone wants to do versus what they know they should do, but can't seem to bring themselves to do it. I know I should change. I know it should change. I want to change. On the other hand, I don't want all the change. It's too difficult. I'm scared. I'm frightened. It's the unknown. So we find a compromise and we begin to take steps in the right direction that aligns goals and values and allow the person to express their true self in a safe way. On a side note, but I promise related, the next video down in your module is a TED talk that uses this tug of war metaphor to introduce another counseling approach that would work really well here in ambivalence, acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT. It does what it's called. It helps build acceptance and commitment to self and change. And there's also this really great concept of willingness included. If you're hanging around 12-step meetings, you might be familiar with HOW, 
honesty, open-mindedness, will, willingness. And this how goes hand in hand with act. So when we're talking about ambivalence and denial, procrastination is a defense of avoidance, shifting responsibilities for decisions to others and exaggerating the desirability of the status quo. So what this means is if a person's procrastinating, they're avoiding or shifting responsibility. And it might sound like, I know I want to get there, but I'm not ready right now. Or I know I want to get there, but I forgot to do any work. So we can help explore those skills and elicit and evoke change. If not right now, what does it look like? Play the tape out. Should you make these changes, what do you envision it looking like? What's a worst case scenario? Talk to me about what it looks like and how do we find a balance somewhere in between? Hypervigilance is a panic that ensues during ambivalence and results in a paralyzing effect. There's a lot of pressure in making change and committing to change. There are a lot of emotions bundled up and we're just starting to unravel it all. Fight, flight, or freeze starts to take action. And for most people, they'll just freeze. And we can recognize that ambivalence is occurring and help people to explore what's really happening, what's really setting off that panic alarm for them, and help them engage in self-rescue, self-regulatory coping skills, and allow them to cope differently in those moments and allow for change in the future. Often, people who experience ambivalence are described as being in a state of denial. Some people are truly in a state of denial because their bodies and minds cannot process the information or consequences. Think of cognitive dissonance here in that belief that we want to hold attitudes and beliefs in harmony and avoid disharmony. Our brains are so magical in the way that they protect ourselves from fully recognizing the magnitude of the consequences of our actions. It's survival, right? It's self-protection. It happens subconsciously. It protects us from collapse under our fears. So subconsciously, we put all of that incriminating, if you will, evidence in the back of our minds until we're ready to get there. And the truth is without help, some people are never willing or able to open those evidence lockers themselves. As a state of denial is this idea of being stuck between a rock and a hard place, not knowing any better, not knowing the difference, being fearful of the unknown. And denial can sound like, I'm okay where I'm at. I don't need to change. And then I would launch my counter argument to that, an intentional, meaningful, open-ended question here like, are you okay? You say that you are, and you've shown me things that are not okay, things that you wanted to change. So can we talk about where the discrepancy lies? Or sometimes just, are you okay, is enough to evoke. Ambivalence in the stages of change. Ambivalence is part of what can be expected throughout the change process. Again, you're likely to see this in early stages of change, but it can come up throughout any of the stages, even for people who have a ton of coping skills that have quantity and quality of recovery and are in the maintenance stages of change. There might be something that provokes a lot of emotion within them that's generating ambivalence, and they need to do the work at the time to make sure that they've explored all of their options and develop the best agenda that they can. Ambivalence is a natural part of the therapy process and understanding that a client's behavior might be a good method of protection from threat is important to remember. But most people are in the contemplation or pre-contemplation stages, and these people might be involuntarily mandated individuals to treatment. So people who are externally motivated might have more ambivalence to change than those who are internally motivated. And that might not always hold true, but I think it's something to assess. And so just think about it right now. Come along on this thought experiment with me. If I told all of you, look, you really need to cut back on your sugar intake. Sugar isn't great for your bodies. There's tons of studies about it that, you know, all the harm that it causes. And don't even think about replacing it with those artificial sweeteners. Those are even worse. So starting tomorrow, we're going vegan, plant-based, raw, organic, no sugar. It's good for you. Believe me. Now just hold that for a second. How willing are you to make this change right now? If this was real, are you going to do it tomorrow with me? Probably not very ready because it wasn't your idea and you don't feel a personal connection to it. It might all be true. You know, that diet might actually be good for you, but are you willing? So same stuff as a probation officer telling a person who recently got a DUI, Hey buddy, you got to lay off the sauce. I'm going to put you on an ankle monitor today. And it's going to tell me if you drink. And if you do, you're going back to jail. Good luck. Right? We've probably got a lot more work to do to even get to ambivalence than with somebody who decides for themselves that change might be a good idea. So regardless of whether they're internally or externally motivated, people still have a choice to come to treatment. And if they are sitting in your office, they've made a choice and they have made a choice for themselves, despite if they're telling you that the courts made me come here. 
The courts did not make you walk through my door and answer my silly intake questions. So let's talk about the reasons why you did decide to come here today. Clients in the contemplation stage of change are more likely to be acutely ambivalent. So here we're going to see exasperated ambivalence, and there's a lot of confusion, and this is where agenda setting will start to help clients express ambivalence and value exploration will start to help clients prepare for the action stage. We need to be aware of those who want their cake and eat it too, or feel trapped between a rock and a hard place, or playing tug of war with their substance or with the legal system. This is all ambivalence. There's a lot of methods to work through this. What's next is some MI and some solutions focused therapy options. And you might find that you like one more than the other. You might find that you like CBT or Gestalt and what they have to say about it. The rule here, despite us burying ourselves in an MI text this semester, is that the relationship is central. Work with intention. Choose a model you like. Choose one that works for your population. For me, art therapy lends itself really well here. So what you don't want to do is yell at or punish your clients for not changing on your timeline. That's not going to get you anywhere but your supervisor's office getting scolded, if not fired, and the client will surely revert back to their old ways. So Am I change talk and sustain talk? There's a lot going on in this slide. I can't wait to dig into it. But if you're having trouble identifying if your client is in ambivalence, am I maps out some easy ways to just think about how they're using language? So you just pay attention to the language and it'll tell you. And they call this change talk and sustain talk. So change talk is any language that's an argument for change. It's a verbal behavior that signals movement toward change. And there's two types of change talk preparatory change talk and mobilizing change talk and motivational interviewing offers this cute little mnemonic to help us remember darn cat. So when you see a darn cat, you know, there's a change of ruin. So preparatory change talk involves language that signals the exploration of change. There are four types of preparatory change talk, desire for change, ability to change, reasons for change, and need for change. Mobilizing change talk signals movement towards the resolution of ambivalence in favor of change. And there's three types of mobilizing change talk, commitment, activation, and taking steps. So breaking these down a bit more, starting with preparatory change talk and the darn here. A desire for change signals a want. For example, I want to stop using drugs or I would like to learn more about my options for inpatient rehab. Desire statements often begin with I want to or I would like to. Wanting is a way to be motivated for change, but it's not essential for change. Sometimes people decide to change even though they don't want to. Ability involves a person's self-perceived ability to succeed at changing. For example, I could go on a run when I notice that I'm craving a smoke. I can imagine this change. I'm able to cut back on how often I use cocaine. Notice that the ability statements often begin with I could, I can, or I'm able to. Reasons for change involve statements about specific reasons for change. For instance, I would like, or I would be happier if I had more friends. If I did my homework, then I'd be less worried about my grades. Reason statements often have an if-then format. If I did this, then that would happen. If I stopped smoking crack, then I'd be able to be a better parent. Need involves statements that stress the importance or urgency of change. For example, I need to be able to pay my bills. I need to get custody of my kids back. I have to get better sleep. I need to find a way not to get fired from my job. I must find better ways to relax. Need statements often start with I need or I have to or I must. Need statements do not state why change is important. Important. If they did, then it would be reasons. Again, reasons for change are specific reason. Need statements just imply importance or urgencies. And I know a lot of you mentioned that evocation sounds like it might be the trickiest. So here's some evoking questions to keep in your back pockets for darn statements. So why would you want to make this change? Evokes desire. How might you go about it in order to succeed? Evokes ability. What might be some reasons to quit if you were to do so? Evokes reason. And how important is it for you to make this change and why? Evokes need. So what do you think you want to do? Evokes change talk. So mobilizing change talk. In mobilizing change talk, we're talking about our cat. Again, this is commitment, activation, and taking steps. Commitment is the clearest form of mobilizing change talk. It signals that change is likely to happen. We use commitment language when we make promises. So examples include, I will, I promise, I swear, I pinky swear, I give you my word. 
when our clients make these statements, we know that change is likely to occur. Another form of mobilizing change talk is activation, which indicates movements towards action. It's not necessarily a form of commitment, but it does indicate that a person is leaning in a certain direction. Examples of activation statements include, I'm willing to work harder next time. I'm ready to go on medication. I'm prepared to make sacrifices. Notice that these statements are not as strong as commitment statements, but they do suggest that commitment might happen soon. And the third form of mobilizing change talk is taking steps. When a person takes a step, they've done something in the direction of change. For example, I searched online for inpatient programs that take my insurance. I tried throwing out my pack of cigarettes. I didn't use heroin for two days this week, and I called my cousin to chat about that NA meeting that they always talk about. Often small steps taken towards change are hugely important because every large change involves lots of tiny changes. A person who locates a nearby inpatient or residential treatment program isn't necessarily not using drug yet, drugs yet, but they're closer. A person who quit heroin for two days and then starts again hasn't really quit, but they're getting closer to quitting. And this means it's very important to affirm even the smallest of client steps to help keep them motivated toward change. And then on the other side, sustain talk. So now we turn to the opposite. In sustain talk, our clients have statements that support the status quo. Consider the statements, I don't want to move. I've always failed at giving up meth. I'm really comfortable with my marijuana use. My health will be okay if I just drink less. And I think it's important here to recognize we don't necessarily want to push a client from sustain to change, that there's not a right answer here, but we pay attention to the language that they're using to choose the appropriate ways to see where they are, meet them with interventions that are appropriate to where they are in that change process. Can you imagine if you came in hot with some action stage change language, mobilizing change with someone who was in sustained talk and their way through pre-contemplation. We're going to miss the mark and ultimately the client won't won't feel seen or heard. So here's a discussion prompt here too. What techniques might you implement to guide an individual with substance use disorder through change and sustained talk? Miller and Rolnick talk about the preparatory change talk and mobilizing change talk like a mountain. Climbing up a mountain, the preparatory change talk is often a long and slow process. You'll feel a big difference when mobilizing change talk starts to happen. It'll feel like an easier task of skiing down a mountain. really just want to wait to see the end of this video. I mean, this guy climbed so far, we should probably watch. Okay, cool. Miller and Rolnick talk about the preparatory change talk and mobilizing change talk like a mountain. Climbing up a mountain, the preparatory change talk is often a long and slow process. You'll feel a big difference when mobilizing change talk starts to happen. It'll feel like an easier task of skiing down a mountain. So shifting gears here, we've been talking a lot about MI, and I want you to know that MI is great, but it's not the only game in town. There are other approaches to consider with addiction treatment, and one approach that complements MI is solution-focused therapy. Ambivalence has a great place in solution-focused therapy, and solution-focused therapy is predicated on the idea that clients are merely stuck or struggling with the ambivalence rather than sick. And they have the capacity to orient themselves towards wellness by choosing better solutions than they've done in the past. Solution-focused therapists are not necessarily interested in what the problem is, but they are more interested in recognizing what the exceptions to that problem is, what solution might exist. So what skills do individuals already have to allow them to be well? Because we've seen people be well despite challenging times. So solution-focused therapy orients the client to expect exceptions when they could effectively work through these problems that they're now struggling with. So I'm here to walk you through some solution-focused questions that might sound a lot like what we've been learning in MI so far. Like, tell me a time when you didn't use your drug of choice and how you were able to do that. Who was around you? What state of mind were you in? How were you feeling? What caused you to change the way that you would typically handle that? So we're exploring the solution to the problem. When we take a solution-focused therapy approach, we're allowing one of two things to happen. The client can explore specific instances in which the outcome was different, 
which is a potential roadmap to the client's current dilemma. So we're engaging in that value exploration and agenda mapping. Tell me about times where this didn't happen. Tell me about times when this was different, using a ton of open-ended questions. We're affirming, we can reflect, we can summarize those experiences to have a depth of understanding that will create a catalyst for change. And in doing so, a client may begin seeing him or herself in a new way again. The problem is the solution in solution-focused therapy. The client's problem is seen as the client's attempt at a solution that hasn't worked, or maybe it's just not working well enough. Therefore, the counselor focuses on the client's attention on times when they were successful at coping and not when they were ambivalent. Solution-focused techniques include techniques such as the miracle question. If you woke up tomorrow and a miracle had happened overnight, things were different, your problem didn't exist, what would that look like? Walk me through your day or the crystal ball technique, this might be more appropriate for younger adolescents struggling with addiction. This concept of a crystal ball, if you could look into a crystal ball and have life be different, tell me what it would look like. Or a movie director approach I think is a little bit more fun. If you could be a movie director to your own movie, what actors would you be involved? What characteristics would they represent? Who would play you? What what would the movie be about? What would it look like? What setting would it be in? What would be the outcome of the final moments? What would that movie look like at the end? And then there's scaling questions. It's sometimes easy to make measurable scaling questions on a scale of zero to 10, zero being the worst you've ever felt and 10 being the best you've ever felt. So where do you feel today? How do you want to move from, say, a place that's of a number five to a place that's a six? Or what does being a number 10 look like for you? And the exception questions. Tell me about a time that the problem did not happen. Tell me about a time when you were triggered to use a mood-altering chemical, but you chose not to. There was an exception to the rule there, and I'm interested to know that what assets and what strengths you had to walk through that exception and not to use. So another discussion prompt. What are similarities of solution-focused therapy and motivational interviewing that would support the client in self-exploration to identify values, beliefs, and attitudes? Ambivalence and addiction are tied hand in hand. As they say in addiction, progress, not perfection. For scaling the client reports to feeling a five, our goal is not a 10. Our goal is a six or maybe a five and a half, or maybe our goal is just to sustain a five and not move backwards to a four. So we recognize ambivalence as part of change. We recognize ambivalence to the addiction process. We help to assess where people are in stages of change, and we explore solutions to the problem by looking at exceptions, by learning from experience, and utilizing the skills, strengths, and coping strategies that individuals are already using. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I hope that you are as pumped about ambivalence as I am. Let me know if you have any questions.